Looking together today in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3. This passage has been called the most important paragraph ever written. When we say that Romans is about good news, this passage is the heart of the good news. It's the very kernel, the nugget of truth that it's all about. And so if you want to know what the point of the entire Bible is, you came on the right Sunday. It's this. It's this passage right here, these verses that we're going to look at today. So if you get this, you get the point. If you miss this, you miss everything. Sometimes it's hard to get the point, though. Sometimes we have trouble listening and understanding. Um, Lauren and I, we have this dog. He has a hard time getting the point. His name is Ace, and he is high energy. About every other week, we discuss how we want to give him away. It's true. Literally, we'll sit around and have these conversations. And... So uh, we have some friends that said, uh, you know, you need, you need some help. And so uh, they gave us a training collar uh, to, to uh, use with him. And so uh, it's electric, and it, 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 what it does is it vibrates, has a setting that it vibrates kind of like your cell phone would um, to uh, alert him whenever he wants to bark, which is like all the time. And so we put this collar on him. And he was outside, and I was pretty skeptical about the, the validity of this, but he was out there, and he saw something that he wanted to bark at, so he started barking, and the collar went off. And it freaked him out. He stopped barking immediately, and he looked around behind him to see what was making this sensation, to see what was causing this thing. And he, he just started running away, which was funny because he was running away from himself. He's wearing this collar, so it's following him wherever he's going. And he is just trying to figure out. He could not, for the life of him, figure out what was happening. But he did do one thing that was very, very important. He stopped barking. It was awesome. It was, like, miraculous. And so Lord and I were like, man, we've got this new dog. It's transformed him. It's changed his nature completely. Almost. So guess what? When we take the collar off of him... He's kind of back to his old self. He, he'll bark and he'll, you know, he'll forget. You get the collar out and he gets it. So what I've done is not really changed my dog or changed his nature any. What I've done is I've trained him now through this device. I've modified his behavior such that when he wears this thing around his neck, he doesn't act as crazy as he normally does. And, and that's kind of the essence of what most people think that uh, the Bible is all about, that Jesus is all about, that Christianity is all about. Is this, it's this external thing that you put on your life that helps you conform your behavior. And that if you get out of line, it gives you a little jolt. Just like, get out back on track, get it together, buddy. And it's this external thing that doesn't really have any power To change you. And that's not at all what you have in the good news. We said this passage is so important because I'm telling you, this is something you need to get, and so many people don't get this. So let's let's set this passage up. Let's remind ourselves of where uh, where we are in Romans. All of Romans from the the middle of chapter one down through chapter three in verse 20 had one point. We took several weeks, in fact, probably took us more than a month to walk through those verses from chapter 1, verse 18, all the way through chapter 3, verse 20. But the main point was that all of us are sinful before a holy God. Romans 1, 18 says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness. That's where you and I fall under. We came in Romans 3, and we read that there is none righteous, no, not one. It doesn't matter if you're religious. It doesn't matter if you're moralistic. It doesn't matter how scrupulous you are in your life. You and I fall short. In fact, verse uh, chapter 3, verse 20 says, because by the works of the law, 
by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. Translation, no one can be saved by keeping the commandments. No one can be saved by keeping God's word. No one can be saved by walking into church, by attending church, by going to Sunday school. No one can be saved by being baptized, by taking the Lord's Supper, by doing and in, in giving money, by going on a mission trip, by reading your Bible, by praying. No one can be saved through the work of the law. Because through the law comes the knowledge of sin. All that we can get to through the, all of these religious activities that we experience, all that we can get to is the place that we realize we're sinners and we fall short. So you say, well, that's not good news. It's not good news if that's where the book ended. But it doesn't. So you've got to understand the good news before you can ever appreciate how good the good news is. And so he's helped us do that over the last several weeks. Okay, so now we're ready to read this. And, and here's the question that is going to be answered here in Romans 3. If we're sinners, if we're under the wrath of God, how do we get right with God? That's the question Romans 3, 21 through 26 answers. How do we get right with God? Now, I want you to think about that question. That is the most important question you could ever ask or answer. How do I get right with God? But here's the thing. This is a question today that no one is asking. Here's the questions we ask today. How can I be happy? That's the question we ask today. How can I find fulfillment with my life? That's the question we ask. How can I find purpose and meaning in this world? Those are questions that we ask. But the question we're not asking is how do I get right with God? I'm not saying those other questions aren't important, but they're not primary. They're not the question. They're not the most important question. And so if we come to the Bible with the wrong question, if you come to the Bible asking, how can I be happy, you're going to be disappointed at the answer. Because the Bible is not written to show you how to be happy. Christianity is not, not about uh, making you feel fulfilled or happy. And then some of you are like, well, I'm out. No. It's about something better than that, more significant than that, by far. And what's so interesting is if you answer the first question, how can I get right with God? The answers to the other questions of life follow from that question. But if you don't get the question about how can I be right with God, you can chase all the other answers you want and you won't find those things that you're seeking. You won't find happiness. You won't find fulfillment. You won't find meaning because it's all found here. Now, are you ready for it? Are you ready for this most important passage in Romans? Let's stand together. Let's honor God and his word. Romans 3, verse 21. But now, apart from the law, why does he say apart from the law? Because by the works of the law, verse 20, no flesh will be justified. So, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness, because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. 
By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. Do we then nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we just ask today that you would speak to us. You would help us to understand these words, help us to answer this most important question in our hearts and our lives of how we can be right with you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the gospel. And we pray that you would speak to us today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all may be seated. How do I get right with God? How do I get right with God? As we answer uh, this question, we read it. And so what I'm going to do is answer it to start off with. And if you're taking notes, I want you to, to write this down. And then we'll unpack this idea. Because when I answer it, it won't be immediately apparent what I mean. So how do I get right with God? Well, here's how. Getting right with God comes, getting right with God comes by getting God's righteousness. Getting right with God comes by getting God's righteousness. What on earth does that mean? Well, first... Let's unpack that statement. Let's talk about it because this is what Romans 3, 21 through 31 is telling us. So first, getting right with God, understand it, that it requires righteousness. That's where he begins in verse 21. Look at it. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested. To manifest something means to make it known. So it's as if God is saying, here, this is what you need. Right here. He's made it known. He's made it clear. He's made it apparent. In fact, Romans 1 told us that all creation is without excuse. God has made himself known to us. And so our need is a need of righteousness. We need God's righteousness. What is it? What is that? Righteousness, uh, here's how I would define it, is the condition of someone who perfectly conforms to the character of a holy God. Righteousness is the character of a person that, that perfectly conforms to God's perfect will and character. Here's what is important to understand about that. That you can't be right with God without righteousness from God. You can't be right with him without righteousness. So he says it comes to us, this righteousness of God that God has made known to us, it is revealed to us apart from the law. Apart from the law. Meaning that your performance, my performance, doesn't achieve it. We can try, we can strive, but we fall short. Keeping the law is not the way. But at the same time, look at what he says. Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, but he says it was witnessed by the law and the prophets. And so even though you can't get to God, you can't get righteousness by your performance, by looking at the Bible and saying, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do all that stuff that it says. I'm going to keep all those commandments. I'm going to do that. You can't get righteousness that way. But all of those commandments, all that you see in the Old Testament, all of it reveals God's righteousness. All of it reveals how God's plan of salvation works. And he points us in all of it to Jesus. And so understand something. Whether you're reading Genesis, whether you're reading Leviticus, whether you're reading some other prophet in, in, in the Old Testament, it doesn't matter what you're reading in the Old Testament, all of it points to Jesus. All of it points to God's plan for salvation. The whole book of 
all of Scripture is about these words that we've read right here. So it doesn't matter where you're reading, it's all pointing to Jesus. So righteousness comes only from God. It's something that he is revealed. And so he makes this statement. He says there, uh, he says, um, look at verse 22. In fact, if you are somebody that takes notes, you write in your Bible, this would be a great place to write something. Um, And just to underline this phrase or draw a circle around it, whatever you want to do. For there is no distinction. There's no distinction. Our standing... Your standing, my standing before God is no different than anyone else. Now there's a thought that is hard to wrap your mind around. We struggle with that one. We live in a culture, especially today, I think more so than ever, this has always been true, but it is definitely true in our culture today. We live in a culture that loves to divide us. We're divided based on economic lines, classes of people, based on whether you're wealthy or not wealthy, whether you're poor or rich, whether you're in the middle, whether you're part of this group or that group. What's your political affiliation? This group, that group, this this special interest, this tribe, that tribe. Uh, We divide ourselves in our culture based on ethnicity which is one of the stupidest and shallowest ways we ever come up with to divide somebody. Let's divide people based on the way they look. Isn't that crazy? It's so stupid and sinful and foolish. It'd be as dumb as if we said, we're going to divide all the people that are bald-headed, and you guys got to sit in the very back. And uh, those of you who have blonde hair, you get to sit in the front. And those are, It's dumb, it's meaningless, it's an outward distinction. But yet our culture has majored on dividing people up based on the color of their skin and, and, and saying that this and that and, and it makes people different in their character and in their idea of who they are. It's, it's absolute foolishness. Here, here he's saying, There is no distinction. So you can divide people up any way you want to divide people up. You can look at this group and that group, but understand something. There is no distinction before God. We all stand before him equal and equally in trouble. That's the point. And so there's no, you might think, you might walk, you might have strutted into church today and thought, man, I am somebody. God is impressed with me. No, he's not. He's not. You're standing, and, and the person that you would be tempted to look down your nose upon and say, man, I can't, how did that guy even get in the doors of this church? They, we're on an equal footing before God. There's no distinction, he says. Wow. So that's an offensive word for people who are religious. If you're religious and you're moral and you're upright, you feel like, well, I'm, I'm pretty good. What do you mean there's no distinction? What I mean is God's not impressed with your religiosity. God's not impressed with the morality that you demonstrate. It doesn't achieve anything towards your salvation. It doesn't give you extra credit. My, my boys were excited. They didn't have to take, they, they had good grades or whatever. They didn't have to, they don't have to go to school. This next, they're exempt from their exams, right? It, it doesn't work that way with God. Like, oh, I'm exempt. I, I'm doing pretty good. Everything's going good. No, it doesn't work that way with God. You can't achieve any kind of standing, any kind of righteousness, any kind of, you're not able to contribute anything towards it where you could say, God, look how good I am. Why not? Well, look at verse 23. For all, circle that word all. Underline that. Highlight that. Your name goes there. My name goes there. For all, not some, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The word sin there describes missing the mark. Some of you are hunters, you're marksmen, uh, whether you uh, use a bow or whether you use a gun and you have a target and you aim at that target, you might be a good shot, but here he's saying it doesn't matter how good of a shot you are with those things. When it comes to sin, when it comes to righteousness, you and I miss the mark every 
time. That's what sin is. It's missing the mark. And so he says, we fall short of the standard. We fall short. What's the standard? Perfection. (laughs) Holiness. The glory of God is what he says. We fall short of the glory of God. And so eh, we, we really, really need to realize the seriousness of sin. Anymore in the church, we don't even talk about sin very much in the church anymore. We use euphemisms. Well, it's not that we sin, it's that, oh, oh, we made a mistake. Do we make mistakes? Yeah, but there's a difference between a mistake and a sin, right? Uh, we we kind of come up with labels for sin because we don't want to tear people down, and, and that's not the point of calling something sin. Calling something sin is not to tear somebody down and make them feel bad. It's to call something like God calls it. Sin is missing the mark of God's standard. And so when we call something sin, and so that's our problem today. Sin is the greatest problem. And and convincing people of that is really something that is a big challenge today. So even uh, here today, your biggest problem, think about this, your biggest problem today is not that you're unhappy. Some of you are like, no, I think it is. You don't know my wife, Brother Chris. You don't know my husband, brother. You don't know my situation. That is my problem. I'm not happy, and I want to be happy. That's why I came to church. You need to tell me how to be. That's not your main problem. That's not the greatest challenge that you face. The greatest challenge you face is your sin. So the Bible is clear. And and the issue of sin affects us not just in our relationships with others, but it affects us in our relationship with God because we fall short of his glory. And so God is our standard. So what we do, though, is we love to make other people our standard, don't we? We love to compare ourselves to other people, right? So if you feel convicted about something, you feel like, man, I'm not, I'm not doing so good. I'm, uh, you know, you, all you got to do to make yourself feel better is to find somebody else that's, that's worse off than you are. And they go, oh, well, I'm struggling, but at least I'm not like that guy right there. Woo! Right? And you can always find somebody. And so we come up with all these things to make ourselves feel righteous, right? So it's all these things that are really a covering because none of those things matter. Remember, there's no distinction. So no matter whether you're comparing yourself to someone else, you feel righteous, more righteous than they are, you're, you're not because you fall short of God's standard. God is our standard and his glory. And so um, the, I was just thinking about this. The, the, on Wednesday nights, our kids um, will be over in the education building. And there's some steps over there, kind of like these steps here. And uh, if you hang out after church on Wednesday nights, inevitably what happens is the kids will hang out around the steps. And there's a contest that, that happens. I don't know if you've ever seen this or participated in it. But the contest is, can you jump off the steps, right? And so usually it's the younger kids, right? And, and they'll, they'll, they'll start at the bottom step, right? They'll be like, can I jump off a step? And they're like, look at this. Oh, I can do it. And then they're like, oh, maybe I can jump off two steps, right? So they jump. Woo. Oh, that's amazing. I can do two. Maybe. Maybe I can do three. Some of you are like, you okay? You go. You go three. Oh, that's amazing. Maybe, maybe you could do four. Maybe, maybe from the top step, and then, and then it becomes like, how far out can I jump? How far do y'all think I can jump? Front row. Front row. <laughs> Some of you are like, you could just take that stride. You could just reach out to brother Chris. You just walk across there, brother Chris. No. I'm not going to do that. Some of you are like, whew. Some of y'all front row people, you're like, okay, I don't have to catch him. Now, what if we made the contest, what if we added something to it? What if we said, it's not just see how far you can get, but we set up a standard where we said, you know, the distance is from the stage. You've got to jump from the stage to the back, of the, the back wall. So what if, I, what if I got a running start? Stage is pretty long. What if I got a running start, and I just, I've never run in church before, this is fun. What, at least when I'm preaching, I I can remember. What if I just got a running start, and I just 
leapt off this stage. Could I get to the back wall? No. Maybe I'd make that front row. I don't know how graceful that would be. What if I worked out for 90 days with all the top trainers in the world? What would that get me? Another foot or two? But of all of that, it would be dumb of me if I did all of that and then I, I, I made that like the purpose and, and, and the, just the, the highlight of my life. I'm Chris Johnson. I'm the guy that could jump off the stage and I can get 10 feet distance. I probably can't get that far. It'd be dumb, right? Because I'm falling short of the stage. I can't even get to the back wall. I couldn't do anything that really impresses anyone. And some of you are like, I could jump way farther than you, Chris, right? And some of you are like, I wouldn't jump at all. I'd break something, right? I, here's the point. That's where we are when it comes to comparing ourselves with God. We're just trying to leap across something that we cannot physically get to the other side. I couldn't possibly, it is not humanly possible for me or for an Olympic athlete to get from here to the back wall. I don't care what kind of supplements and drugs you put that person on. They're not jumping this far to that far. Why? Because the distance is too great. So when he says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, he's telling us, that's me, that's you. The distance between you and I and between us and God is too great. You and I need righteousness, but the distance is too great for us to get. And so here's, understand something about this. Here's, the, here's some practical application in this. Understand this. We don't just need forgiveness today. We need more than that. Forgiveness deals with the negative. It deals with our sin. Yes, you need forgiveness, but you need something positive to get you there. You need righteousness. And on your own, all you can do is fall short. It's just as ridiculous as me jumping off this stage. I'm not going to get there. I fall short. It's not in me. I don't have the ability. I don't have the power. And so sin is what? keeps us from God. We need his righteousness. And so think about today this issue. How do I get right with God? Think about this issue. What's my main problem? It's not that you're unhappy. It's this issue of sin. Psalm 51 verse 4 says, against you, Lord, and you only have I sinned. Now, that sounds kind of hard to understand. Doesn't our sin, doesn't it go against other people when we sin? Doesn't it affect other people? The, the Bible does affirm that, right? Yes, but what he's saying there is primarily and above everything else, yes, your sin impacts other people, but first and foremost, your sin is against God because God is the one who made you. And to sin against him, to violate his law, that's, the issue, that's the biggest problem that you and I face. And so if you tell a lie, you've sinned against the person that you withheld the truth from. But more and above the, everything else, you've sinned against God. You commit adultery, you've sinned against your spouse. But what you really have to contend with is that you've sinned against God. And that's what we need to be concerned with. That's what he's telling us is the issue today. And so uh, we're, we're afraid of all kinds of things today, right? Our culture, we, we, you, you could look at, turn on any kind of news uh, that you want to, and the main emotion that you'll come away with is fear. We're afraid, and that's, I mean, that's how, do you, how to get people's attention, make them afraid. And so that's what, that's what the media multiplies on. They love this issue of fear, generating fear in our hearts. We're afraid of everything. We're afraid of diseases. We're afraid of the economy doing something negative. We're afraid of some kind of political outcome. We're afraid of something that might happen somewhere that we've never heard of that might impact us in a way we've never thought of. 
right? We're afraid of all of these things, but there's one thing we don't fear at all in our culture, and that is judgment. That is hell. We don't even think it's real. But the Bible says it is. And so that's the issue to be concerned with. So you and I, to escape hell, we need righteousness. And there's good news because God has provided it. You say, well, I don't like this talk about judgment and hell. But it's real. So if we don't talk about it and it's real, we're lying. We're lying to ourselves and we're lying uh, to, the, to the world. And so Jesus has made a way out of it. And so uh, you and I need more than good behavior. We need God's righteousness. And so only God can provide it. So here, here's uh, what you see. And what I want you to do is look in verse 24 and verse 25. We've seen that we can't achieve it on our own. We, we've seen that if we strive for righteousness, all we're going to do is we're going to fall short. We're not going to get there on our own. But God has done something for us in Jesus Christ that we need to focus on and spend some time with. Look at verse 24 and verse 25. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. So you and I can't get there on our own. Our righteousness is not enough, but God's righteousness is is it's a gift that he gives so there's five words i want you to see uh in this section there's five words i want you to see and the first one uh look at verse verse 24 is this word justified the word justified talking about god's righteousness how he provides it to us how does he do it there's these five words will help us understand first it is through this issue of justification. It's a word from the legal arena. And if someone is justified, what happens is it is a legal pronouncement over that person. And so where someone has been guilty of violating the law, to be justified is to declare, to be declared where you are acquitted of all the charges that are against you. And so the sins that you've committed no longer count against you. So think of justification. Here's the opposite of it. The opposite of justification is condemnation. That you are sentenced to pay for what you have done. And so to be justified is to be released from the penalty of sin. By that pronouncement of that fact that you are justified. It's a new status that's bestowed on you. And so you enjoy it in the moment that it is pronounced. So he says here, God's righteousness comes to us through this process of being justified. God makes a declaration about your life that you are no longer guilty. That you are no longer under the penalty of sin. That you're no longer under, Romans 1, 18, the wrath of God. Some of y'all, that's as good as it gets. Y'all act like you're not happy about that. That's good stuff. Secondly, it's a gift. It just gets better. I mean, it just gets better. So we're justified. Then he says it's a gift that God, we're justified as a gift by his grace. So so, something about a gift. It's not earned. You can't earn a gift. Otherwise it's a wage. Right? A gift is unearned. It's undeserved, but it's given to you anyways. Wow, that's good stuff. So what God has done for me, I don't deserve. It's a gift, but he's done it for me anyways. But a gift, another thing about a gift is, yes, it is, it is free to, to me, but it must be received. It must be acknowledged. It must be accepted in order for me to benefit from it. So 
He talks about justification. He talks about the gift that is salvation. He talks about then this third word that you see here is in verse 24, by his grace. Oh, man, grace. We could, like, that's a whole sermon. That's a whole sermon series. That's a whole, that, you can't do justice to this in a single definition, but I'm going to do my best to give you what is, what is grace. What does it mean? Grace is God's good will expressed in action. God's good will expressed in action. God's good will expressed to us, it's undeserved, it's unmerited. We live in a world, and I grew up in a world that was all about self-esteem. It was all about making you feel good about yourself. Some of you are like, Chris, you didn't, that didn't impact you very much, did it? Because all day today, you've been telling me how bad I am. You've been telling me that I'm a sinner, that I'm under God's wrath. Like, that self-esteem really didn't do much for you, did it? Well, here's the thing about self-esteem. Here's why it's so, so misguided. It's because it doesn't deal with the real issue of our life. It just deals with how you feel about yourself. So, yes, there's some wonderful things about you, but not everything. And so he tells us here that, that God's salvation comes to us by grace. And so that flies in the face of the entitlement that we live in. We have this entitled mindset that it is expressed in two ways. One is we say about everything, we say, oh, I deserve that. Right? Something good happens or we want something good. We're like, this is what I deserve. We're saying, I've earned it. Or the other side of it is if something bad happens to us, here's what we say. We say, whoa, whoa, whoa. What did I do to deserve this? Or we'll say just flat out, I don't deserve this. I deserve better than this. Here's what we don't understand in our world today. We don't understand the word grace. We don't. We don't understand the concept of God's grace. God's grace teaches us that we don't deserve anything. If you got what you deserved, if I got what I deserved, whoo, you don't want that. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness of men. If you got what you deserved, if I got what I deserved, I'd be a crispy critter. Grace is what we do not deserve. And so anything good, anything positive in our life is the grace of God being expressed. If you're breathing right now, which maybe for some of you that's an open question. <laughs> like, is that guy over there, is he, is he passed out? But if you're breathing right now, guess what that is? That's God's grace. If you ate a meal sometime in the last week, guess what that is? That's God's grace. If you're able to physically move and get into this room and hear a sermon and get into this place and get around God's people, that's God's grace. There are so many blessings that we just say, man, I deserve this. No, we don't. Man, we got to thank God. And most of all, what we deserve least of all is what God has done for us in Jesus. That's God's grace. So he's given us something that we don't deserve at all, but he's so good and he's so loving that he has done that for us. He's made a way for us to be, look at what he says, the fourth word, redemption, to be redeemed. This was a word that was used to describe where if someone was a slave, you could be purchased out of slavery and delivered from the bondage and set free with the payment of a price. That's the word redemption. And so that's what Jesus has done for us. It was uh, first used, it's described of how God treated his people in the Old Testament. He redeemed them. They were slaves in Egypt. Pharaoh had them under his thumb. They were doing only what Pharaoh wanted them to do building his cities, working, enslaving for him. 
and God stepped in and redeemed his people. He brought them out of slavery, and he brought them into the promised land. He set them free. There was a price that was paid. The people were delivered. Redemption brought them into the promised land. Redemption, that's the word. There's a fifth word here, and it's the word propitiation. And I want you to understand this word. You might be, you might be thinking, I can't even pronounce it. How, how, why do you want me to understand this word propitiation? I'm never going to use it, but I want you to understand what Jesus did for you. So look at it. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood. So there's a connection between propitiation and the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus meaning that he died. He poured his blood out for you on the cross. He died in your place to pay for your sin. That's what Jesus did. And so propitiation involves the doing away with our sin. And so what Jesus' death did, it accomplished several things. Our sin is covered by his blood. So we're all equally in a mess, but yet because of what Jesus has done, he, his, his blood covers our sin. Okay? He covers our sin. And then it's removed from us, our sin is removed from us, and then we're declared righteous before him. And so thereby, the wrath of God, which would be coming our way, Jesus has removed from us. And so to propitiate someone means that they are now favorably disposed towards you. And so we go from the place of wrath to mercy. Wrath to rescue. That's what God has done for us. And so he has set us free. He's delivered us from the punishment, the, the, the penalty of sin. And so Hebrews 8.12 says what propitiation accomplishes. It says that I will remember their sins no more. When Jesus died for you on the cross, that's what that accomplished. That when God looks at you, if you know Jesus Christ, God does not see your sin. He sees Jesus' righteousness. He took your place. Listen to some other passages that explain this as well. Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west. As far as the east is from the west. That's as far as God has removed our transgressions from us. Micah 7, 19 says, He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. So instead of us being punished for our sin, Christ took that penalty. Hebrews 2, 9 says that Christ tasted death for every man. That's what Jesus did for you. I got to quit. I've got like 18 more pages of notes. And I'm not even, I'm not even, I'm not even there. So I just got to figure out how to stop where I am. This is what God has done for you in Jesus. This is the righteousness. So I want to close with this. So how does this righteousness come to us? Because that's the question we started with, and I'll flesh some of this out. This is part two next time. Y'all be back next week, right? Part two. Ready? How does that, how do I get right with God? How does that righteousness come to me? So glad you asked because it's very, very simple. Look here and it's repeated several times. In case you miss it, it's repeated. So verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Look at verse 25, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. Verse 26, so that God would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. So God's righteousness comes to us by faith. 
So how do I get right with God? It's by coming to Jesus Christ, by receiving him into your life. Some of you, I know you've done that. That's why you're here. That's why you're gathering here with this body of Christ today. You're saying, I've done that a long time ago. I know that I'm in Christ, and we have a lot to celebrate. I'll unpack more what that means for you as a believer. But some of you here today, there's never been a point in your life where that's clicked for you, where you've realized that your sin has separated you from God and you need his righteousness. And so today, I want to give you the opportunity right now, this morning, to trust Jesus Christ to give your life to him, to do what we just read about by faith, to put your faith and your trust in him and what he's done. Some of you need to do that. I want to give you the opportunity. I'm going to ask right now that everyone just bow your head with me. Close your eyes and don't worry about what somebody else is doing. But right now, if that's you, you need this righteous, you need to get right with God today. Maybe this is why you're here today, is to hear this message. You didn't know it when you walked in the room, but God is speaking to you right now. You need to give your life to Christ. I want to invite you just to do something simple, to take a step of faith. I'm going to pray a simple prayer whereby you could respond by faith and trust Jesus Christ. And so if that's you, I'm going to pray out loud. You just pray silently in your heart, expressing your faith in Jesus Christ, your trust in what he's done. For you. Would, you, would you pray with me if this is, if this is your prayer today? Just pray something like this. Dear God, I confess today that I'm a sinner. I confess that I've fallen short of your glory. But God, today, I put all my faith in what Jesus did for me. Thank you that he died on the cross for me. Thank you that he rose from the dead for me. And God, I confess that Jesus is Lord. God, I ask that you'd help me to live the rest of my life for you. Thank you today for saving me. Thank you for coming into my heart, coming into my life. I want to ask right now if you prayed with me that prayer you trusted Christ today you, you came to him by faith I want to ask that you do something bold nobody's looking around right now but I just want to ask that if you did that just so I could know so I could be praying for you I'm not going to point you out but if you did that would you just lift your hand up and say pastor I just want you to know I'm not ashamed I trusted Christ today I prayed with you just lift it up Put it back down. Just lift it up for a second. Just go. Yep. I did that too. Put it back down. Father, these moments are, are yours. Uh, this time is, is just for us to celebrate and to worship you. I pray you'd help us to respond in this invitation uh, just as you would have us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us all across the room? We're going to sing this song, this hymn. The words are on the screen. If you need to be saved, we invite you to come. Our pastors are here. We'll be happy to talk to you. Maybe you did pray uh, to trust Christ. You want to let somebody know about that? You can come right now. Maybe God's doing something else in your life. Uh, maybe today you need to take the step of following Jesus in baptism. You can come and let one of us know. We'll help you with that. Maybe some other need. Maybe you just need to come and pray. Right now, that's what this time is for. So we're going to sing, and you just follow God's leading right now.